All right, we're about to start in a um, couple of seconds. All right, I just wanted to um, begin workshop number 131. I wanted to welcome everyone to this workshop. Um, the workshop is on balance in cybersecurity, human rights, and economic development. Um, the topic is a pretty um, big one in the sense that it does cover a lot of issues that we believe is interrelated. Um, the the thing that we wanted to look at is that in actually doing economic development, oftentimes people don't take into consideration the human rights implications that it could have and oftentimes does have. And it's also recognizing that as governments oftentimes when we're looking at cybersecurity, we try to look at the security side of it in trying to just ensure that our citizens are safe. Um, and on that note, um, my name is Carrie Ann Barrett. I am um, from the cybersecurity program from the Organization of American States. Um, this workshop is being put together with that thinking with the Global Cybersecurity Capacity Center, um, Privacy International, and Charisma Foundation. Um, so the intro I gave it's because um, as the several organizations that are actually organizing this, we recognize that the conversation needs to happen and it needs to continue to happen. Um, recognizing that economic development is where the digital world is taking us in a whole new different way to think about it. And with all the technological advancements and the digital economy being pushed, all other issues that we normally consider has to come into play. Um, on that note, we have a very, very, very dynamic um, panel and I'm really, really happy and proud about it. Um, we have with us Lisa Vermeer, Senior Policy Officer within the Dutch government. We have William Dutton, who is a professor. We have Claudio Kokorukia, he's the Acting Head of Information at the WEF, um, the Entertainment and System Initiative. We have Angela McKay, Senior Director, Cybersecurity Policy and Strategy at Microsoft. And we have Leandro Yusuferi, who is an attorney and he works with digital rights. So if you think about the topic and you think about who we have um, on the panel, we've tried to ensure that we were touching on all the elements that we want to discuss. Um, the structure of the workshop will be that I'll be giving each of our panelists five minutes to kind of give their flavor and perspective on the topic. And then after that, um, I may ask a series of questions just based on your presentation and then I'll open it up to the floor to get your feedback and to have your questions, which I'm really hoping that you begin to think about the topic yourselves, because we want to make this, one of my panelists said to me outright this morning, he's like, please do not make this a monologue. Please ensure that we get the participation of the audience because of the type of topic. So because of his request to me, I'm pleading to you, please participate in our workshop as much as you can. It's a very open and relaxed setting that we want to have. So on that note, I think I'm gonna start with Lisa and probably just give us your flair on the topic. Thank you, Carrie ann for giving me the first, the first floor and um, for the possibility to speak here. It's, uh, it's an honor. Um, it's such a, a wide topic and urgent topic, but that you actually gave me a hard time deciding about what to focus on. Um, because all the three um, issues are um, important but also very broad and in the end I decided to, to focus on two uh, more overarching aspects um, from a government perspective. Um, so the first is maybe rather boring but I thought it might be interesting for you because it's, it's not very common to have an insight in how the government is actually organized. And I'm quite proud on how we organize in our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also in the Dutch government, um, the, the work on these three angles. For example, the team, the task force on cyber, international cyber policy within the 
Ministry of Foreign Affairs has three pillars, and those pillars are human rights, um, international cyber, well, cyber security, um, peace and peace and security in cyberspace, and developing uh, cyber cap capabilities. So the three angles are integrated in one team, which allows us, and I'm actually very proud to be part of that team from the human rights perspective, to really get an integrated view on what's happening in our weekly exchange um, with the group, but also the, the, the regular exchange um, with my colleagues allows us to have interlinkages between these three topics that are not obvious to make because we are able to connect the developments that's, that one of my colleagues is talking about in the field of cybersecurity. I can add a human rights perspective to it immediately. Um, he or she will add to my human rights work with the development work. So this links all the work that we do and, and um, allows us as um, employees, as, as diplomats, to really um, uh, tackle this field and all the challenges that are, that are developing in such a fast pace in a way that is rather um, original for a government institution. So I wanted to share this with you and if you look at the broader government organization in the Netherlands, um, it's very logical for us to approach everything in a very decentralized, inclusive way. And also the, the, the people that work on cyber related issues in the Ministry of Economic Affairs, in Foreign Affairs, Justice and Security, Interior Affairs, they all um, really aim to, um, we have a lot of meetings that uh, focus on specific developments and then bring all the people together. And it's sometimes it feels as if we are in this bureaucratic a vicious circle of, of working together, but in the end it has an impact because we all know what to do. And an illustration of this is that our Dutch delegation to um, IGF, for example, is a very, from a government, because it's multi-stakeholder, but the governments are all represented, all the different aspects are represented, and we're here. And we're also in other IGFs which are farther away. So. Um, this is this is something that works very good for us and, and 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 ensures as well that we have an impact in the in international cyber policy as an actor that matters although we are a rather small country in the end um, and the second point I wanted to focus on is uh, the importance of inclusiveness and uh, multi stakeholder cooperation um, I think Ariane you have a tremendous panel with all stakeholders uh, uh, present at the panel, maybe not all, but at least a, a, a broad um, panel. And, and it's our firm belief from a government perspective that you need to have all the voices around to be able that you have um, impactful policy or regulation or regulatory initiative with broad support from a broad group of people that really are supported and therefore will be implemented and, and have its impact. You can only have good policy if you, if you um, engage all the different stakeholders. This is a firm belief and um, as you probably might know, we try to materialize it in various ways and I just want to mention a few because I think um, I won't go into everything. I made a list myself and I was like, oh no, it's, it's incredible. It's the GCSS, the GFCE, the FOC, the WISIS, the ITU, the UNGA, the, it's the GCCS in The Hague. They are all processes um, that, are, that we focus on to make it as inclusive as possible. Two of them, like the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace and the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, are explicit multi-stakeholder initiatives that we support financially or in kind in any way because that, that's the only way to have impact. And if you look at the more multilateral um, processes like the, the third and the first committee at the UNGA in New York or the ITU or the Freedom Online Coalition, we always make sure from our, that we really push for forums that enable participation from civil society, private sector, academic community, and especially from a human rights perspective, I really would like to address the fact that civil society is important. Um, and we do not only want civil society and NGOs to participate, but we want, we, we strive to enable them to 
have valuable participation and impactful participation, not only being there, but really bringing their meshes across, know in what kind of settings you end up. For example, the IT or the Human Rights Council, it has a very peculiar setting that can be very intimidating. So it's our belief that we have to prepare as well civil society groups to, to be able to have a valuable participation. Um, so last but not least, I want to mention our programming offers. Um, of course, uh, governments have, uh, can have a lot of impact by financing groups, by being a responsible donor. And one of the initiatives that we found, found is uh, the Global Partners uh, Digital that really work on inclusive and multi-stakeholder cybersecurity strategies in several countries. So we're actually very proud to be able to enable this kind of projects. And I'll leave you with that, and I look very much forward to dive a bit more into the three topics after with the discussion with the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll hand it over to Leandro. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Um, so I, I first um, wanted to start by saying that um, having a human rights perspective is not incompatible with business development and, and an economic perspective on uh, cybersecurity development. So basically my role here today is trying to put an end to the fallacy that if we put human rights at the forefront of uh, business models and uh, the, the economic development of companies, um, that it's not incompatible with being profitable or even um, appealing to investment and growth. So first, uh, just to, to refresh a concept that we understand is closer to uh, a human rights approach to cybersecurity um, is the work that the Freedom Online Coalition did with one of their working groups. Uh, and they defined cybersecurity as the preservation through policy, technology, and education of the availability, confidentiality, and integrity of information and its underlying inf infrastructure to enhance the security of persons, not only online, but also offline. So I think it's worth um, coming back to this concept when we talk about cybersecurity, uh, because it gives us a framework on how to, how to start thinking on, uh, on the very deep policy development. Um, so to go in deep in terms of um, human rights and what we mean by that, well, governments, um, we all know that they have both positive and negative ob obligations uh, for human rights, that is, uh, to take measures in order to uh, guarantee their enjoyment and, um, and exercise, um, as well as avoiding uh, or refraining from carrying, uh, carrying out activities that may uh, undermine or interfere with human rights Businesses as well are bound to these kind of obligations. Um, and we have um, already uh, principles developed by the UN that state that companies and businesses need to avoid causing or contributing to human rights impact through their own activities or even um, prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are, relate, that are directly related to their operations, products, services, and so on. Um, so we can, we can talk about specific cases on this, but uh, one of, we can talk generally in terms of, for example, corporations um, cooperating for surveillance um, and other use cases that we need to take into account. Uh, so going back to, to uh, cybersecurity policy development, um, together with, um, Charisma and Tarek uh, and ADC, uh, the organization that I work for. Um, so it, basically, these three organizations in Argentina, in Colombia, and in Paraguay, we developed together um, a whole set of, um, of documents and, and a framework to give not only um, people, but specifically companies as well, um, guidelines on how to think about cybersecurity through a human rights lens. Um, so one of the, I, I wanted to highlight a few points and then we can maybe uh, go in depth throughout the workshop. Um, so basically, when, when we address um, how companies interact with cybersecurity, we're not only thinking about the need to, to protect um, the products and the services or uh, the platform in the, in the very sense of the word uh, protecting, that is, uh, security measures that, that can be taken technically, uh, but rather to put a human rights approach to, to that 
um, business development. We can think on topics such as privacy by design that tries to implement a framework uh, rooted within the company's culture that in, in that way you can start thinking on how the whole process um, cares about um, the people whom you are uh, trying to um, to, to address by your product, by your service, and, and so on. Um, also, ethical considerations when talking about the technological developments that you're putting out to the world. Uh, there are a few, uh, a few examples on how to think ethically, um, and this, are, this is also related to uh, one, of, one of the topics that you might have heard before, which is data minimization, for example. Um, so it's, you, you can't start, stop worrying a little bit about data breaches if you minimize, in a way, the amount of data that you are collecting itself and your dependence on exploiting your users uh, and people's data. Uh, so these are a few like, brief topics that can be taken into account to start thinking on human rights without maybe talking directly about human rights, but rather it's uh, taking this into account to uh, indirectly start respecting uh, privacy, freedom of expression, association through your own uh, business development. Um, I also wanted to highlight that, um, in that we already have legal frameworks on this. I, I, I already said that uh, businesses are bound to human rights obligations. Uh, but they are also bound to different legal frameworks within um, uh, at the national level where they were based or even in, in countries where they operate indirectly uh, or where the users may be based. Uh, for example, data protection considerations. Um, another, uh, another topic that can be taken into account when, when thinking through a human rights lens is also uh, transparency, um, transparency as a whole, uh, as, a, as a cultural approach within the company and how to talk to the people who your products or services are addressed to. Um, so we, th there's been a lot said in terms of transparency reports um, and from the experience of organizations uh, in Latin America, we've seen that they are usually the exception uh, and companies don't take transparency reports into account that much. Um, so that's another thing to, to consider and how they, uh, they think on communicating their own work to, to the people. Um, also, when we think about the private sector, um, it's worth noting that uh, it, when we talk about cybersecurity and the private sector, it's usually um, the financial sector who is involved. Uh, or you think about uh, the, more, the more traditional business sector um, that not necessarily is uh, uh, comprehensive of a concept that also relates to, for example, news outlets out, out there that are also for-profit organizations and that need to be taken into account in this, human, uh, in this uh, cybersecurity debates uh, where journalists have their own needs of uh, digital security protections and measures that, that need to be taken to address uh, also their needs. Um, when we uh, when we talk about having civil society involved in these uh, policy processes, policy, policy development processes, um, and one of the one of the questions that uh, that Carrie-Anne wanted us to to address as well is how to start taking civil, uh, civil society into account as well in these debates. Um, and I would first start by saying that it's important to build trust among the different stakeholders that work on this topic. Um, and it's easy to, to spot contradictions on, on, on this topic uh, globally, uh, where you have governments advocating for cybersecurity, but at the same time doing surveillance on their own, on their own civil society groups uh, and journalists and so on, like other different groups. Um, so it's, it's worth taking into account the need to generate trust among these stakeholders. Um, and also in, in terms of um, being able to listen to their needs, uh, perhaps one, one positive work that can be done on that is having an independent uh, body, for example, a CERT, that can talk directly to, to civil society groups and um, allow for that fluid communication 
and, and identifying their needs and concerns uh, and address that uh, from um, a human rights respecting approach as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, and uh, then I have a few other points that we can address through, through the, yeah, through the debate. The okay, great. Um, Claudia, I don't know if you could take it next to Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you're not suffering from workshop fatigue and, and continuous monologue. So I'll try and keep this as short and sweet as possible. Um, so I... Um, I work for the World Economic Forum, which is an international institution that's focused on pu public-private partnerships. We're most famous for our annual meeting that happens every year in Davos. However, in between those annual meetings is where pretty much a lot of our work is done uh, and, and th the significant amount of what we're actually um, should be more better known for happens. Um, we do have a, uh, a center for cybersecurity, which is a new center that's uh, launched the forum. I'm not, I'm not here representing that, and I won't be speaking about that in detail. Um, what I personally lead at the forum is all of our work around the creative economy and the information ecosystem. And we take a, very, a systemic view and approach to those, let's say, uh, uh, those ecosystems. Um, and we look at interlinkages between, uh, let's say, different challenges and issues that affect those, those ecosystems. And cybersecurity is clearly one that, um, that uh, uh, let's say, we, we deal with. Um, and in general, what we've noticed is that uh, there is a trend, at least in the private sector, um, of, uh, uh, let's say, being much more con uh, conscious and aware of um, individual companies' impact on society moving forward. I think there is a societal demand. We've seen a trend in the past few years asking, um, let's say, companies that have more of a, uh, a social purpose. Uh, and what we're seeing is this emergence of the importance of digital ethics and privacy in general. And I think what we're going to see, at least in 2019, is um, companies taking that much more seriously, in particular the, the digital platforms, uh, especially after some of the scandals that have come up that have, let's say, infringed on, uh, infringed on human rights, uh, in particular, personal data, basically personal data management and privacy. I think we're going to see uh, trends towards uh, much more protection, much more care in that area. Um, uh, so, so that's a positive note uh, that I'd like to, 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 to leave the, the group with. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've noticed in our work around the creative economy and from society is that one of the key causes of, let's say, challenges and issues related to um, cybersecurity, especially from a human-centric approach, is, is a lack of, let's say, literacy or digital media literacy and skills. Um, and through, through our work, we have actually incubated and facilitated the creation of an organization called the DQ Institute. DQ stands for Digital Intelligence. So if you follow sort of the logic of what IQ stands for and EQ, emotional intelligence, then digital intelligence is actually a, a comprehensive set of technical, cognitive, and socio-emotional competencies that enable individuals to face the challenges and adapt to the demands of digital life. So it's a very comprehensive sort of set of competencies. And within there, we have, uh, you know, th this institute has defined eight different uh, competency areas, uh, everything from digital identity to digital rights, digital literacy, communication, emotional intelligence, in particular digital security and digital safety. So these are competencies that we have noticed already at a very young age um, can be built um, uh, very concretely and society needs those to be built very concretely because those will impact obviously um, you know, some of the challenges now facing cybersecurity, um, uh, particularly around personal data um, and privacy, and also, let's say, freedom of association. These are all things that I think relate to digital citizenship in general. Um, and so what we've been focusing on is very this sort of acupuncture point within the system of challenges that if you're able to increase the, the, the level of digital intelligence in citizens, then you you automatically improve the level of cybersecurity and that in cybersecurity's impact on human rights. 
So again, following sort of a systemic approach, this is what we've noticed and this is what we've been focusing a lot of our work on. Um, so I'll leave it to, at that. I don't want to continue with my monologue and I'm very, very much looking forward to discussing at least that aspect of, of cyber security with the uh, rest of the panel and, and the group. Thanks. Thanks, Claudio. And um, so just to kind of tie together as we go into Angela's intervention is if you think about it from the government perspective that we've already spoken about the role that this can interplay in economic development and policy and even what um, Leandra has spoken about in terms of ethical development and then getting into increasing the digital intelligence. I think one of the role that Angela has been playing is that whole private public sector um, relationship and how it can be impactful and I think um, I'll just hand it over to Angela now. Thank you, Carrie Ann, and uh, thank you to everybody who's in the room. It's exciting to be here at the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, this is, in fact, my first Internet Governance Forum, and I think very clearly starts to represent the kind of integration of security, economic, and human rights that is starting to occur in the ecosystem. In my opening remarks, I thought I would actually just highlight that, how approaches to these three domains are actually evolving and starting to integrate with each other. As Carrie Ann noted, and I just would say this very briefly about my background because it plays into how I look at these issues. I've been at Microsoft for 10 years and I lead our global public policy work on cybersecurity. Before then, I um, worked supporting the US government in the development of its initial civilian government cybersecurity efforts. And before then, I was an engineer for a company that doesn't exist anymore called Bell South, which is now AT&T. Um, I say that because those different points of view, both having spent time in industry, having spent time with the government, and having spent time as an engineer on the technical side of the issues gives me some perspective as I look at the last 20 years of approaches to improving security, economic opportunity, and human rights. Um, what I would highlight is, in the beginning, these strategies really focused on three core principles, being risk-based, being based in public-private partnerships, and focusing on a series of consequences which notably did not include human rights and digital protection. It really talked about how do you protect national security, economic security, and broadly public safety. What I find really interesting is on a global basis, and Microsoft looks at how policies are moving on a global basis. We watch the policy developments of almost uh, over 150 countries on a global basis. Whether folks are de for developing their first cybersecurity policies and strategies or updating them, what I'm finding very encouraging is these strategies now incorporate three additional factors. They are starting to look at not just national security, economic security, and public safety, but human rights and individual rights, ethical considerations, and as one of my colleagues here noted, transparency and how to improve transparency of government efforts, transparency of industry efforts, and to help improve the digital literacy of the populace um, so that they can engage in these conversations. A couple of things that I would highlight here is, I think moving forward, ways to continue to drive this integration, which by the way, it's not easy. These different folks come from different camps and different expertise, in many ways, as is represented by this panel. And so you have to find models that help bring these different points of view together. But ultimately, I think we are going to have to improve how multi-stakeholderism works, how it becomes how it gets operationalized, and how to ensure it also incorporates more multidisciplinary backgrounds. So how do you have not only the techies and the policy makers, but also the folks who are representing the more um, artistic side, understanding human behavior into these conversations. I also think it's very important to recognize that how these strategies operate will not be uniform globally. Each different nation, as they're moving forward, needs to ensure that their strategy represents the local context in which they are operating. 
Values are very different in different parts of the world. How governments work with society, what society expects of government, how industry operates, and the relationship between industry and government, and the relationship and expectations between industry and society actually differ in different places in the world. This is one of those things that I have found so enjoyable about my job. But as I've engaged in different places, some people trust the government to take care of issues. Others more trust industry. Others really don't trust either and are looking for answers to come in a more bottom-up context. And so strategies have to actually ensure they represent local context. They also have to ensure that they represent where um, the country is in version of its digital transformation. There are those who are moving forward with some of the most advanced technologies with cloud infrastructure, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And then there are also places in the world that are really getting online primarily via mobile devices. And these strategies have to, accompl uh, have to accommodate those differences. Um, last two points is I think you know, ultimately, you can improve security, economic opportunity, and human rights in parallel. They are not exclusive. At the same time, there will be trade-offs. And these trade-offs are something that the society has to be involved in to make helpful decisions that represent, again, the values of a particular geography and context. I think one of the things that is very hopeful and that was announced here at the beginning of IGF by uh, President Macron is the Paris call. Um, I think one of the things we found very encouraging about that at Microsoft is that the Paris call represents the applicability of international law, humanitarian law, and customary, um, customary law in terms of moving forward these rights and opportunities in the digital age. With 51 governments, over 219 members of industry and 92 civil society organizations, it does represent a major significant milestone in the multi-stakeholder dialogue, and we think that that is a significant milestone in that evolution of how to improve these core values in harmony. Thank you. And I think that perfectly segues into Bill's work when you think about the role that academia plays and research plays in informing all of the dialogue that we just have. So, Bill? Okay. That's, okay. Thank you very much, Carrie. And, and, and the, um, let, me, I, let me try to take a, a, suggest a, a different perspective on this that is slightly uh, different from the, what I would call an impact perspective. But uh, uh, I like the digital citizenship concept uh, from uh, the World Economic Forum. And it reminds me, uh, the OECD had this report called uh, Digital Security Risk Management. And it's a nice term, but it's all so that they don't have to use the term cybersecurity. <laughs> <laughs> the C word of somehow the cybersecurity has become a C word and or a, 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 why? Because uh, somehow it, it threatens people. That is, if you have a cybersecurity focus, you're going to stomp on human rights, you're going to stomp on everything, other, everything else we value, so to speak, or it, it, it throws that kind of risk. And so that's unfortunate. And I think that, um, so now we're thinking of, okay, when we develop cybersecurity policy, we need to get, gather multi, multiple stakeholders around the table to make sure that we respect human rights privacy, uh, so forth, and uh, economic development, and that we don't put any of those at risk in shaping cybersecurity policy, and I get that. But um, I think that everybody, you know, other people are doing, you know, we've got, we're still stovepiping this stuff that, that uh, uh, freedom of expression folks are, are developing policy with multiple, let me suggest a different way of looking at it, which I call the ecology of games, or the ecology of policy, which is that, um, I don't know, there might be a few people in this room who get up in the morning and thinking that they're going to secure the world uh, on, on the internet. But most people wake up in the morning thinking they're gonna do very uh, many other specific things. They're gonna get their kids to school, they wanna sell software, they want to, uh, 
uh, make a living. They, they have many more concrete goals and, 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 or they want to uh, fight for equality or they want to support freedom of expression. So even when you think of cybersecurity, you think of how many actors there are involved. It's a dramatic, you know, it's really overwhelming the n number from users to policymakers to tech technical communities and so forth. But it's worse than that. Because what, uh, what we have is um, you have to think of any actor, any given actor is, is focused on various objectives that may be very different from your own if you're interested in cybersecurity. And they pursue those actions. And so you have many games going on, trying to support freedom of expression, trying to support privacy, trying to support safety, trying to put support um, economic development. And so each of these policy areas have a variety of stakeholders and actors shaping policy in those areas. And the outcome of those efforts shape security. So that security is an outcome of, of an ecology of games, that is many policy deliberations going on in many different arenas. And I think what it means is if you take that on, and, uh, and again, I've been thinking about this for, as I was introduced as the professor, or as a professor, <laughs> and professor, as professors do, I've been thinking about it for about three decades. So, <laughs> so the, the idea of an ecology of games brings you into the fact that uh, instead of thinking of the impact of cybersecurity on different outcomes, like economic development, which we can study and we can connect those, um, you have to think of the different, different people are involved in these different policy sectors and we, people interested in cybersecurity in the ideal world, they will try to follow developments in all of these areas because you need, to, it's not that you need to bring the multi-stakeholders around the table to talk about cybersecurity, you need to be around the table talking about freedom of expression, equality, and all these other areas because the outcomes of these other policy debates and other policy choices will shape the future of cybersecurity. So, it, and I think it, it's a subtle move from the impact and, and keeps you in that limited area of focusing on cybersecurity to a broader view of, uh, of the whole, the range of policies that will impact security and how do you get a grasp on, on the, all the actors, the larger group of stakeholders that are involved in all of those games. But anyway, that, if, if there's any interest, I'm happy to talk to people about it. But I think, it's, I think it's a subtly different perspective that would move us beyond just having um, input from multiple stakeholders to uh, us uh, having a larger scope of, of uh, of interest in, in many more policy areas than cybersecurity. And I think that's a, 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 I mean, Lisa and I were saying, brilliant, <laughs> because I actually was going to ask that, a similar question. I think what you're calling for is a call to rethink multi-stakeholderism, how we, how we view it from a cybersecurity lens. And I think I wanted to probably take that opportunity to probably ask Leandro, because one of the things you spoke about was ethical development, but you also kind of touched on cross-pollination across expertise, even within civil society. And I think that's one of the things um, that we don't talk about, that even civil society itself, in terms of someone is a freedom of speech expert, not necessarily working as much as we probably want them to work with, with persons doing gender issues to make sure that there's a merger at all times. How do you see this call to rethink how we approach multi-stakeholderism even impact in civil society groupings. Um, I just wanted to throw that at you. Um, it, it is a tough question. Uh, I'd say it's also a challenge for the organizations that we work on um, on digital issues uh, and, and put that uh, digital lens through the different human rights that we address. Uh, because it's not talking about uh, digital rights, like it's another thing. It's basically human rights through the, the impact that technology has on them. Um, I'd say that it, it's, it has been tricky for us as well to uh, at least 
from the organizations that, um, and I can just speak for myself here, so I will be cautious, um, that we don't work on at the grassroots level. So identify the people and that work at the grassroots level and what are their needs is also a challenge for us, even within civil society, as you mentioned. Um, I'd say that uh, we have taken uh, the approach that was mentioned uh, on having that holistic uh, view on how to address cybersecurity, um, at least from our own perspective, which is trying to think on how cybersecurity affects uh, these different topics and trying to identify them um, and be cautious on what kind of rights are, um, are being interfered with. Um, through those topics. Um, I, I would say that, just, just to, to highlight again, one of the, the problems that we identified is that cybersecurity is being used as a catch-all term. Uh, and one of the problems is that because it's being used as, a, a, as everything and anything, um, it's, also we, it's also the need that we have to uh, reshape that narrative uh, as well. Uh, that's why I just wanted to, I, I uh, started my, my presentation by um, refreshing one of the concepts that we identify as uh, the more uh, clear approach to, to what we mean by cybersecurity is basically protecting people. So that I think that, that needs to be the lens. It's protecting people, not only when they use technology, but when they go through their everyday lives. Because even if they're not using technology, there are third parties that are implementing te technology that impacts on the, that people. Uh, so it's from the government to the private sector, implementing technology, um, you've probably heard a lot about um, smart city developments and how uh, governments are starting to implement technology to measure and monitor uh, people's lives, even if they're not using that technology like directly through their own hands. Um, so that's what we need to take into account. It's always about protecting people um, and making sure their rights are safeguarded. Um, so I would put that out uh, for, for discussion as well. Um, but yeah, I would say that I agree in terms of identifying uh, the different needs, even within the, the stakeholders. It's also one thing that uh, we need to take into account f through our own work, I'd say. Um, but it's, uh, it's not impossible. I think I wanted to, I want to throw a question to both Claudio and Liesel because what you're speaking about is a people-centric approach to cybersecurity, starting from the people. And both of them used two, made two statements which I enjoyed was increasing the level of digital intelligence. And I think that is what would actually contribute to the discussion of them being part of this policy development. And Lisa, you mentioned the role of multi-stakeholderism being impactful on, regu on regulatory policy because it is that unless you're, if you've increased intelligence, you won't be able to have that impact. So I wanted to see if you would unpack, to, unpack those concepts a little bit more. Yeah? Sure, I'll start off with uh, sort of also building on um, what um, uh, Leonardo was uh, saying about, uh, uh, you know, cybersecurity being people-centric. Um, if we, I mean, I, I'll go back to the, um, the, the, the digital intelligence framework that um, the DQ Institute has developed because um, uh, although we have specific competency areas for development around security and safety, um, there is, those eight companies are interlinked with each other. Um, an example is we have uh, one, one area of competencies called digital identity. So this is about how do you ensure you, yourself as a uh, user of the internet, as a user of digital platforms and media that uh, your identity, your own identity secured. Um, and because obviously that has an impact on, on uh, your safety online um, and also on sort of general secu uh, security, uh, you know, being hacked and whatnot uh, in your account and stuff. So um, again, I think um, uh, DQ is very focused on, on people. Um, and as a result, a lot of the partnerships that we are forming are with uh, ministries of education. So looking at how do we capacity build, you know, how, how do we make the DQ concept something that is um, evangelized and embodied in the, in, in the classic public education system. But at the same time, um, through a, uh, another coalition that we helped form called the uh, Coalition for Digital Intelligence, 
which includes the OECD and IEEE, which is um, uh, an industry setting, sta uh, tech industry, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, standard setting body. Uh, we're also evangelizing and trying to standardize this framework also across industry. Um, so that when you look at vocational training, you look at corporate, uh, you know, cybersecurity issues that come up from, uh, let's say, the corporate uh, environment. So data leakages, uh, leakage of, uh, let's say, perhaps uh, uh, confidential information being hacked uh, within a company. Those, those, de those core DQ competencies are the same. They're just perhaps at a, at a higher level, more, more advanced level. But they're the same, and, and they're, they, they broadly, um, let's say, uh, 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 relate to everything that's important to industry as well from the cybersecurity perspective. So although perhaps a lot of companies look at cybersecurity as being something about protect, protection, protecting their intellectual property and their, in their, in their assets as an organization, a company, it is, that is still driven by people. It's the, it's the people in, the, in those organizations that create those data leaks that perhaps even create those, uh, those opportunities for being hacked. Um, so again, going back to the, the importance of it being um, people-centric, it's not just for the benefit of the individuals themselves, but it's also for the benefit of corporations. Because if, if your employees are, um, uh, have higher levels of digital intelligence, then you as a corporation will be stronger and more protected. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, I was indeed struck by your your um, turnaround, more or less, of the of how you should how we should debate. Um, well, bridging bridging the barriers between the people in the various policy fields is is very challenging. Um, and to to come to um, progression or or well, in, from my perspective policy or regulation, you have to make sure first that you talk about the same thing, that you address security, that you know what you refer to if you say security. And for example, the, la the English language is also uh, is already quite interesting in my sense because you have safety and security, which means something different, but in Dutch you only have veiligheid. So it, in the Netherlands already, you have to make sure that you talk about the same set of veiligheid that we all want to talk about. So um, both from uh, both if you want the cybersecurity people to um, engage with other discussions or human rights or econo economists, etc., to engage in the cybersecurity discussion, there is just this um, matter of language and, and fora that you have to overcome to be able to discuss with each other uh, what you actually want to, want to um, uh, perceive. Um, so, in, in answer to your question, um, what if you talk about regulation, what I mentioned, like you need to have a multi circular process to have impactful regulation and, and policy. Um, uh, the, it, to make regulation and policy requires a very careful, slow, in, in our perspective, process, because you have to have the input of all the various players. Um, and in that way, you can avoid unintended cons consequences of regulation that is, uh, in a sense, very powerful because it's, it's, it's set by states. So as an illustration, for example, in the EU, there's the governments of the EU are quite hesitant in regulating, um, for example, content or the internet, although Macron, he was quite fierce on <laughs> the wish to have regulation, but there is nothing much in place at the moment. And at the same time, what you see is all in the rest of the world, various forms of laws and regulation that are um, launched, such as uh, tax on social media, uh, well, you name it, all the examples that I hear from, from the people around here all the time that are ways that governments try to regulate quick and often, very often, increasingly, they're legitimized by security, cybersecurity, national security, but often cybersecurity is a legitimation of all kinds of regulation with very well intended or unintended consequences that couldn't have been foreseen. So if you look at the, the, the approach that, that we would say is, is desirable is that if you engage a lot of people with a lot of perspectives in your processes, for example, by consultations or in, in lawmaking processes of, um, um, you, can, you can map 
all the consequences and all the material, but it means it's going very slow. And at the same time, the developments are going very fast. So it's an ongoing challenge on, uh, on how to deal with this. And I think I'm going to ask one more question and then open it to the floor. And the question is for Angela and for Bill. Um, I think starting with Angela, um, you spoke about security and human rights running in parallel. And I think one of the challenges that persons have been facing is, from even a human rights perspective, is that government has been taking its traditional role of trying to secure. And I think in doing that, that is when the whole issue of when do you infringe on human rights for surveillance and and even, not even a surveillance argument, because I want to take it even higher, when is it that we will begin to start thinking about um, security in cyber security as really an, an enabler to be able to actually empower citizens rather than a matter of just trying to protect citizens? And um, Bill, in terms of the ecology of games, do you have any concrete policy proposals that we could put forward as to how do we rethink this process? How do we rethink developing policy where it's not us just going out to consult, but it's always a complete, a true open dialogue where human rights persons would invite cybersecurity persons in the room when they're developing um, solutions for the issues that they're facing. So I'll start with Angela, Bill, and then um, please begin to think about your questions. Um, we'll open the floor after this. Um. So the, the fundamental question you ask is kind of when will security be not something that governments are, are pushing down, right? Saying, I need to protect my citizenry, I need to protect my enterprises, I need to protect myself, and, and when will it be more of this enabler? Um, and I think, you know, um, I am personally a very idealistic person, but I'm also very pragmatic. And I think we've got some time before this happens. Um, as, as my colleague from the Dutch government just said, I think there are positive trends in the world and there are some very concerning trends that are going on on a global basis. I think what is positive is all of the news around major attacks that are having impacts on things like the British national health system or, um, uh, or uh, that are having effects on the electoral systems is raising the public consciousness um, and raising the consciousness of enterprises and governments on the importance of security. Break, break, I think that at the same time, the approaches that are going on largely are ones where um, governments are seeing uh, or perceiving a need to act with urgency, and sometimes that need to act with urgency is not always appropriately inclusive of all of the different values that really accrue to representing an, a, a nation's kind of reflecting their overall sense of values. And so I think it will, um, I think at least in the short term, we're going to continue to see movements that are fairly dramatic and fairly swift in law and regulation. Um, at the same time, um, I do think that the social consciousness about digital literacy, digital rights, is coming up, particularly in the younger generations. And there is a, a civic movement to say, hold on, this is my digital domain, and I'm not going to have it mandated or controlled by either industry or government, but I myself will have a voice. Um, uh, we've actually been involved in an initiative that now has um, over 100,000 uh, signatories on a global basis. It's Digital Citizens for Digital Peace Now. Um, and that is, you know, where people are starting to say, this is my domain and I'm not going to have someone else decide how it is going to be managed. And so what I think is, at least in the near term, it will probably be a series of actions that are not appropriate and inclusive of values and the kind of integration of rights and opportunities that need to occur. But as you start to see folks, uh, particularly um, younger folks, move into leadership positions and find mechanisms to leverage technology to express their interest, you will then start to see a change where security does start to be more of an enabler. Okay, uh, I, on the point about 
terminology. I mean, I think you just have to get used to it, that, that uh, people have different definitions of all these terms, especially when you go across d disciplines or, or departments and different sectors of society. It just, uh, I, as, um, I mean, what is the internet? I mean, we, I mean, you know, uh, people have different definitions of that, and uh, what is security? What, it, what, it, all of these terms are, uh, are ambiguous, and and they, but they might be very clearly defined by different people, but in different ways. And you just have to enter every conversation, not assuming that you are talking about the same thing, <laughs> and finding out what they mean by this. You know, we we we. Uh, we do survey research a lot, and we, we say, uh, do you use the internet? And they say, no, I use Google, or I, <laughs> I use Microsoft, or what? We, so we have to, we're used to this, uh, the difficulty of communicating across groups. How do we, how do we uh, implement sort of a cyber, uh, uh, a uh, ecology of games perspective in this arena that, that might be helpful? And uh, um, I, th I th let's say, what the problem with this not having an ecology gains perspective is that all of these things are like, I, I'm an American, and I'd say it's all like apple pie. We all want privacy. We all want freedom of expression. We all want uh, ethics. I mean, who's against ethics? Who's against uh, privacy? Who's against uh, safety? Economic development, we all want this. So how can you be forced to reconcile these uh, uh, trade-offs, and it's not just looking at, um, uh, you know, we'll take uh, 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 one one bit of that and a little bit of that. It's like, so when I did a, um, I worked for the uh, UNESCO asked me to help them on the in the Department of Freedom of Information or Freedom of Expression, is that what that is, or is it free? Anyway, UNESCO's Department of Freedom of Expression, and so I, I talk them into looking at freedom of expression from an ecology of games perspective. That is, don't just look at freedom of expression because, you know, I mean, of course, you know. <laughs> we, and, and everyone says they're for freedom of expression. So uh, you have to say, okay, well, we also should understand cybersecurity policy and how that may impact and who's, what actors are involved in these two in arenas. What, decisions are being made in cybersecurity that might affect freedom of expression. Also, we need to look at pr privacy, privacy, and uh, what, what, what will be the interaction of these areas. And so, trying to get the Department of Freedom of Expression to look at other departments and not be departmentalized and, and actually embed themselves in, okay, that, yeah, uh, we, we know um, that they're doing this because they're pursuing security, they're, these people are pursuing privacy, and these things are conflicting in certain areas, and therefore we have to be, have a much more holistic view on it. And it, it, it may seem more words or more uh, conversation, but I think it, it's a step in the direction of, of trying to balance these. Otherwise, balancing becomes, um, rhetoric, you know, so because if you're still in the department to do X, <laughs> you, you, you will, you know, that's what your mission is, but you need to realize you're in, your other people are in other departments with other objectives, following different rules, and uh, the success of your game or your, your area is going to be dependent on what other people do in these other games not just what you do in your, in your arena. Oh, on that note, I wanted to open it uh, to the floor. Do you have any questions? Yeah, we have one here. Any other? There? Okay, so I'll take both questions and then have the panel respond. Yeah. Could you just um, introduce who you are and probably give your background because I think it's interesting. We, we know that we're multi, we're cross-sectional here, but it's interesting to see who is in the room as well. Hi, I'm Ana Ivy. I'm academic as well. I'm from Mexico, and I have two fast questions. First, we in our country, or in our continent, we have like different realities, right? Because we have United States, and we have countries like Honduras and Salvador that they are really different, and we have a lot of disparities. With this in mind, 
you think it's really not possible, but you can advise about having first uh, principles, uh, this document with principles and objectives of cybersecurity for American region in specific, because I know in, uh, in here in European Union, you have this NIST directive that have all these objectives and principles, and two, you have some um, organism like Initia, and you have to the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence of NATO. So you have all these organisms that are working together to get all the goals. And you have your own Europe agenda, for example, 2030, 2050. So you are going together to the same right, so the same goals, sorry. It doesn't matter if the, the government is different, you got to get to the same goal. For example, in our region, we have like different governments. Every four, six years, we are changing the rules, and it's really hard to can improve something like that. And do you think it can be really useful to have to a consultative council for cybersecurity at the Americas? And the other question fast is, you have, or not to have this economic aspect, aspects of national cybersecurity strategies study that is really interesting. I don't know if we can do that in, with the guidance of the OAS too, because the economics aspect of all the national cybersecurity strategies is some issue that we haven't been working on it. And it's really important if you're talking about countries that are going to, uh, with this development disparities like it's in America region. So that's it, thank you. Uh, this, uh, second person. Yes, Connor Sanchez uh, from the Fletcher School in the United States. And I had a question um, for Ms. McKay, but for anybody on the panel, regarding this concept of um, governments uh, perceiving a need to act with urgency. Um, and so uh, over the last three years, there's been an increase in internet disruptions or state-imposed internet disruptions. And there have been some efforts to sort of portray the, the cost uh, that are inherent in these shutdowns, um, but I'm but there's also a digital rights approach. I'm so I'm sort of wondering what's what would be more effective in the long run, um, taking the digital rights approach or kind of conveying the cost of those shutdowns. Um, just to make sure everybody got the question, um, I, I'll open it up to the panel to take whichever one they think I they can. can. Yeah. Um, I can I can probably just jump in right to the first question uh, briefly. Um, one of the things that we uh, and we I mean the the three organizations that we work together on this regional project um, from Argentina, Colombia, and Paraguay, um, we started to look at the role of um, regional bodies and specifically the, o the OIS and the work they've done uh, through the assistance to countries in developing cybersecurity strategies and so on. Um, and one of the things that we uh, identified is that given that there's another body within the OIS system, the ICHR, uh, that basically can uh, give their input on human rights, um, we've seen that there's still a lot of room for development in terms of um, cooperation among these different bodies. Um, so one of the things that, that we look forward, maybe um, speaking to the, um, to the digital team, uh, DOIS, is um, how can we start thinking on, uh, on these kinds of collaborations where um, the OAS has, and specifically Belisario's team and, and, and so on, um, has this um, expertise on uh, the, the core technical cybersecurity issues and the ICHR who has the human rights perspective on the more traditional sense. Uh, so I think there, there's a lot of room, at least regionally in Latin America and in, in the Americas, uh, to work at that level. Um, I think civil society is quite up for, for, for the task, uh, and we've already, as I mentioned briefly in my, my introduction, uh, we've put out a few documents uh, that are intended as guidelines to uh, steer the conversation um, in that direction, uh, and that can 
give uh, substantive input uh, for people that want to learn how these processes work and how to, to start working on them from that human rights lens um, and navigating the whole OES uh, system. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things that we want to, to highlight. I'll, pop, I'll, pick, I'll pick that up after the panel um, answer the question. Uh, just, sorry, I'd like to add something to, to, to this conversation. Um, perhaps it's my interpretation of your question, so forgive me if I'm not answering it properly, but, and then perhaps it's also a personal opinion of mine, but, I mean, what I got from your question is, you know, can we live in a world where you have two different standards or two different concepts of, let's say, what is cybersecurity and what is, uh, you know, human rights? And, I mean, that, that's kind of like the impression I, I got from your question. To me, it, it, you can't. To me, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of human rights is, I mean, there is a declaration of, you know, a universal declaration of human rights because it's based on principles that aren't based on values or ethics that perhaps can change from country to country. Everyone has a right to privacy and there shouldn't be countries that have uh, different levels of, of, uh, of security around privacy and whatnot. So I, I think the, the answer to your question, if that was really my interpretation of the question was, no, I don't think there should be two separate uh, things. What works for the U.S. Does, should also work for, uh, for other countries in, in the continent. Uh, and that's both for, you know, cybersecurity and for human rights. Uh, and I think, as Bill very rightly said, is everyone wants freedom of expression. Everybody wants uh, heightened privacy and freedom to associate and all that. And, and I think there shouldn't be any, any country or any sort of region that sort of interprets that in a different way. Um, so that's just my... Uh, do you think it can be a good idea to have a council or consultative council for cybersecurity in the Americas so we can reach better backing? Because we don't have something specific, and you have in your union something specific that. We, we would love to have like kind of an ENISA equivalent, that's what you're, you're asking. Uh, that's something that we, yeah, that, uh, as I mentioned, like I, I think that is a role that the OAS with the ICHR can, can actually play in the Americas. And we would look forward to, to having that conversation uh, and at least from civil society trying to, um, to be proactive in collaborating. I'll probably let um, Angela answer her question and then I'll answer. I try not to do the moderator panelist role. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why I haven't answered directly yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so thank you for your question on, on how to make, what I, what I basically understood was how to basically make compelling arguments when governments feel an urgency to act and are taking really um, blunt mechanisms like internet shutdowns. I will just say, you know, I think, um, both from my own personal personal sense of values in Microsoft's um, and when it comes to freedom of expression and access, internet shutdowns to me are a very poor approach to thinking about how to manage um, conflict or strife in a particular area. Um, but how do you make a compelling argument is what I heard your, argument, uh, your question to be. And I think ultimately, a little bit of it depends on who you're talking to, um, where, what, country you're in, what region you're in, and which ministry you're talking to, it actually plays into this ecology of games discussion, that the arguments that you make with different individuals and different ministries and different countries will be compelling in different ways. And so in everything, it is always incredibly important to think about your audience um, and what is going to be the, the set of interests that they are representing. Now, I think the most effective argument is, is to actually think about conveying the set of different impacts that exist and then highlighting those in the context of the audience that you're speaking to. So if you're talking to a uh, Ministry of Commerce, 
you would go in and say, here are the particular economic impacts, but in addition to that, here are the individual rights that are affected as well. And if you're going into talking to the, the, the office from UNESCO on freedom of expression, you would say, here are all the individual rights that are affected, but in addition to that, here are all the economic impacts of that decision. I think putting those arguments together, but making sure you lead with which audience you're speaking to is probably the most compelling approach. We have any other questions on the floor? Go ahead. Anyone else? Go ahead, sir. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Gillo Cutrupi. I'm an organizational security consultant. First of all, I think there is a bit, sorry for the voice. I think there is a bit of a misleading sentence going around where it says everybody is up for freedom of expression, everybody is for privacy, because maybe around this room, yes, but uh, already in governments and in industry, there are many who are against freedom of expression and against privacy. So I, I think that has to be clarified. <laughs> Second thing is a question from Mr. McKay. Is, uh, one of the first uh, obstacles that uh, human rights organizations find, especially in developing countries, if we want to talk about economical development, is beside the literacy, beside policy, is actually access to technology and access to the uh, internet. And uh, I know that many um, parties within the industry, they actually have programs to support NGOs, to support human rights organizations. But what do you think can be done a bit further to support them. Because it's not just the access, but for, as an example, one of the first uh, issues around cybersecurity that can bring more malware and can raise insecurity is to use uh, uh, in, um, unlicensed software. So the moment when we take uh, an unlicensed uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Office, um, and believe me, in Africa and in Asia, it's, they mostly do that because it's the easiest thing and the cheapest. So I know that uh, corporations, they have programs to support uh, NGOs. I would like to know if uh, you are aware of programs that are actually supporting them even more in providing these tools. So, so happy, to, happy to speak to this, and I really appreciate your question. I think um, there is a, there's a huge amount that corporations do, including my own, and yet there is much more to be done in this space. And one of the things I would just maybe even highlight one of our programs that we have been thinking about and some of the evolutions in it, and it is but one program among a multiplicity of programs that are in this space. Um, but it was one that I, I found really interesting that we've worked on refining uh, quite recently. Um, we have an initiative called the For Africa Initiative. Um, the For Africa Initiative originally included three core pillars of work. Um, the idea was not to go and do uh, kind of workshop training capacity building, but actually to help uh, create local capacity and to create local demand. Um, and so it included three core pillars. The first, as you noted, was access. How do you ensure that there is access to not just technology, but access to the internet itself? The second was around skills, and it was originally digital literacy type skills. And then the third pillar, and I thought that this was at the time, this was probably eight years ago, um, um, quite, uh, quite interesting, was a pillar around innovation. How do you actually help um, uh, individuals in region develop business plans and develop the skills and entrepreneurial skills for innovation so they would actually start to generate businesses in their environment that could serve local need. So it was local capacity and local demand. Um, what I think is really exciting is that program has gone through a fairly significant innovation recently whereby in addition to access skills and innovation there's a integration of ethics security and um, it's ethics, security, and um, oh, sorry, now I'm forgetting the third piece. Shoot. Um, <laughs> anyway, the, the bottom line is it's gone through an evolution that starts to represent exactly what I was saying earlier, whereby we're not just focusing on how to get technology into the space, but if you're going to be leveraging technology, how to do it in a way that reflects 
the security needs of the society, the ethical needs of the particular region, and then the third pillar, which I have unfortunately forgotten at this exact moment. I apologize for that. I'm happy to take your information and get you more on that. But what I, what I guess I would say more broadly is not just my own company, but companies in general are continually reassessing that's actually, and then, uh, anyway, uh, are continually reassessing how these programs work, what their effectiveness is, and then actually changing them and evolving them over time to better represent and better actually connect with the user base. And so I think that's one of the most important things is deliver, learn, iterate, improve. Um, Bill has an intervention, and then um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to give us a one-minute sum up of what they want us to take home with us. Bill? Okay, I want to just briefly respond to the uh, challenge on uh, everybody wanting privacy or freedom of expression. Uh, I, obviously, you can find somebody who wants to restrict somebody else's freedom of expression, but, uh, but generally, that is a value that... Um, Certainly, we've, I've done research in about 20 different countries worldwide about internet users, including Mexico and uh, other, other countries where if you look at internet users globally, they have incredibly, uh, surprisingly similar values and, and, and interests. Part of it is that I think you have to think of the internet as an experience technology. You can, it's not just you, when you experience the internet, you sort of get it, and you realize what you can do online, and you can realize in, in Mexico, I mean, it's half, over half of Mexico is now online, and it's a, the digital divide in Mexico is a serious problem, but you have millions of users online, and it's the center of the Spanish-speaking world online, and all this uh, Mexican educated public and, and, and internet users in Mexico are really realizing that they've got a global arena for uh, news and information and entertainment and so forth that they've never had before. And so all through the global south and East Asia as well, you have uh, people who have very, internet users have very similar values. And when they differ, you won't believe this, but uh, it, it's the truth, uh, in terms of the survey research, that Americans, for example, are, are um, less supportive of freedom of expression than many people in the Global South and East Asia, because they take it for granted. They take the media for granted and so forth. In China, there are more people who, who talk about their, po who use the internet for political expression than people in the United States who use the internet for political expression, proportionately. Sorry, Sorry just a clarification on that. It was not directed to the internet users. It was directed uh, at governments uh, and, uh, uh, um, and the industry, yeah. who are really not really everybody for privacy and freedom of expression. Of course, users are one thing, but the other side is policymakers uh, and uh, industry. And I think. Uh, those are actually those that for them is not a lot of freedom of expression and privacy. Yeah. No, no, I mean, I just wanted to support what you were saying. We did research at the World Economic Forum, similar research, not in 20 countries, in, in six countries, but in, in each, uh, the major, sort of the major market in each of the different continents, we did this research and we have the exact same uh, results. Saying it's surprising about how, actually it's surprising about how Americans in general care less about privacy and less about use of their personal data and control of their personal data than Chinese, for example, which view it as a very, very high priority in terms of what they, what kind of internet freedom they want to have uh, or as a user. So very interesting, uh, very similar and interesting uh, results from our survey work. I think, and, I, might, I, think I might have done that research. <laughs> uh, no, no, it was, it was with, uh, our partner was uh, oh, Comscore, okay. so. Okay. But in any case, um, and also, to, to just to answer one of your questions, uh, the, the World Economic Forum has also an initiative called Internet for All, which looks at building, uh, essentially providing access to internet infrastructure through partnerships, through mostly public-private partnerships, but not at all following the, the let's say, the, uh, the Facebook model, which we know has its own uh, <laughs> infringements on personal data uh, and privacy uh, risks. All right, we're going to do the one-minute um, 
wrap up, what do you want the, oh, we have one more in the back, oh. Thanks, so I, I also wanted to just add to what Angela said. Hi, I'm Kaya from Microsoft. So to what Angela said from on the, the licensing point, I think it's, uh, it, you know, it's not a solution to all else, but I would highly encourage everybody to look at the tech soup uh, group where sort of many, not just Microsoft, but Amazon, Google, others, all contribute software into it. So I think that's one vehicle to where we try and sort of share as much as we can with the nonprofit community. Thanks, Kaya. Um, I'm gonna ask probably Lisa to start with a one minute wrap up and then I'll summarize at the end. It's actually quite difficult to decide on what, what it was really a, a very broad and interesting discussion with many things to add. Um, so perhaps it's the easiest for me to, to contribute some um, to the point that you raised, Angela, one a bit earlier in response to one of the questions about um, how you get your message across and the point that you make that you have to take care of who is your audience and how do you bring this um, over and what are the, the set of, of um, values. I really agree with that and I would like to add another um, layer to it uh, based on experiences from from partners of our, uh, our ministry is that um, for example in the case of the network shutdowns it's also very important that, that there is not just a, a broad set of arguments used but also a broad set of actors actually bringing the arguments across because if you have a combined approach for example to breaches to violations of, of freedom of expression and one of the most harshest is of course a network shutdown which is not very elaborate but still practiced very often, uh, most in, uh, in, in African countries, and it's still growing. Um, and it's, at, at the moment, the analysis of, for example, Access Now, together with the coalition against shutdowns, which is rather big, is that you need a set of actors that, that work together to, um, to fight back and push back and prepare, for example, towards the governments and towards the, the companies that are based in a particular country to make sure that it doesn't happen and it's not an, that it's out of the of the menu of options for the government but also for the private sector because it's shut, shut down has to do with with the government ordering a private actor to act so both civil society as the government as other governments for example a dutch government representative in a country together with for example freedom online coalition countries together with the isp that is trained by the isp somewhere else or um, telco companies that are a member of GNI, like oh, you have to find the partners in all the different multi-stakeholders to get across a message, and the message should be tailored to the particular audience and the set of values that is at that space uh, relevant. Um, so it, yeah, let me just wrap up by saying that um, to to have an an impact on on. Um, limiting violations of freedom of expression online, of privacy, of, of internet access, it really requires a very elaborate strategy at the moment to make sure that in the global south, in other countries, but also in western countries, these trends are, are reversed. Um, we all need to work together and cross bridges. So that would be my final uh, word. Thank you. Yeah, so I will be short and sweet. Um, taking on a few of the points that you mentioned, I would say that um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all over again. Uh, I'd say that uh, we don't only need to focus on this um, policy development processes to be multi-stakeholder, but also to focus on open transparent o o openness, transparency, and inclusivity. Um, I think that th those are key values that need to be taken into account in, in these processes in order for the, the outputs of those policies to be really comprehensive of the whole different perspectives. And um, as it was previously, previously discussed by, by my fellow uh, panelists, um, that in order to, uh, to get a sense of what are their, those stakeholders' needs, uh, you need to listen to them and you need to invite them at the table and give them the opportunity to to collaborate and so on so I, I agree on that point um, so I just wanted to to leave it at that and invite you all to read um, uh, the work that we've put out we have a uh, a lot of documents on this topic. Um, they're in Spanish uh, for now, 
but we would love to have them translated in English in the coming months. Um, but yeah, just uh, get back to us after the session and uh, we can surely give you all the, the details. Quickly on my side, um, you know, I think Bill, Bill provided a very interesting uh, concept around this ecology of games and how to look at this, this issue with the uh, link between cybersecurity and, uh, and economic development and, and, and human rights. Um, it, it's, you know, my impression is that that's actually um, uh, a form of systems thinking, which is uh, an approach that's been around for, uh, for a while, but it's also one that hasn't been applied as much as it should be. And I think it's one that the forum is applying right now in its, in its initiative work, uh, taking this systems approach. Um, and I, I guess my, my last point is that I would encourage everyone in this room to uh, adopt systems thinking in their own work. Because again, it's, um, you need to look at the whole and not just the individual pieces uh, when it comes to these kinds of challenges. Um, I think my, my remarks will be uh, fairly short. I think it is really, uh, there is a really key evolution that is occurring in the ecosystem around improving security, economic opportunity, while protecting human rights. And human rights are universal. How those rights are managed and manifest in different places in the world do differ. And then I think that means that what we do is we have to have not only a digitally literate, but a digitally engaged and an engaged society so that the conversation between people, industry, and government can figure out how to reflect those rights and values in the law and systems that are occurring and then how those are managed and manifest reflects the people's will. Uh, rather than summarize, let me add another point. Uh, we did, we've done some real systematic research on the role of cybersecurity capacity in relation to economic development. And I hadn't had a chance or forgot to talk about it. <laughs> But uh, what we, we really can support the fact that with evidence from over 100 countries and using World Economic Forum data, ITU data, and also uh, data on uh, surrogate data on capacity building uh, elements, that when controlling for uh, the size of the country, the number of internet users, the wealth of the country, those countries that have more elements of a cybersecurity capacity are, uh, have higher levels of economic development. In other words, it has an additionality to actual, uh, the well, uh, to, the, to the economic development of the country. And, it, and it, so, anyway, we're still working on that. We're trying to uh, get, dig deeper and get mo uh, better evidence, but from our preliminary work, and it's uh, been accepted for publication, and there's other work in publication, um, Cyber security capacity uh, matters in terms of economic development. Okay. And I think um, I wanted to thank, I think, all the panelists because I think they've done a tremendous job unpacking this. And I think it has given us room for more topics for next year, IJF. Um, because I, I think from my conclusions, just listening to everyone, there's a call for rethinking multi stakeholderism. Mm -hmm. I think just the whole idea of the ecology of games, I think, makes us rethink it. I think there's a call for digital intelligence, for meaningful engagement, I think, which captures the other topics. And there's a call, and not from the audience in terms of the question that was asked to us, the OAS, to consider the role that the regional bodies could play on Latin America and the Caribbean side in doing something similar to what has happened with um, Europe in terms of having a standard that is applicable to all countries regardless of to ensure that we have a safer digital world. Um, so on that note, I want to thank the audience. I think you guys are awesome. And thank you that we, at least Claudia cannot walk away from here saying that we did monologue. So thank you. <laughs>